Thank you for joining us, Mike. Oh, thanks for having me. Like my grandmother said, pull your pants up before you sit down in church <laughs> so you don't show your ass when it's time to leave. <laughs> How y'all doing? I actually found a church with air conditioning in the South. You guys are talented. <laughs> you know, we, we can pull some things off. Yeah. I, I said it backstage, but this is easily the best album of the year so far, and frankly, in many years. I think you're going to be able to drop the so far. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that's, that's reasonable. Well, yeah, you guys, first I want you guys to make sure you get or download the record um, on the 16th because it's meant for you to hear in sequence, to hear from song one to the very end. And if you close your eyes, you kind of see the characters come into play. If you're from Atlanta, you're going to see, smell, taste, and touch it because it's very familiar. Atlanta serves as, um, as the, the co-star and the tale is nine-year-old boy who grows up with this city. How many men in the room, man? How many men in the room? How many working class men or had a working class daddy? My daddy did everything, drive trucks. My uncle drove a bus. My other uncle with a Cadillac drove a got the city truck. So a lot of times we get the you're supposed to protect and provide speech, and that's absolutely true. But man, when you find out later from your dad or your uncle that it's normal to go in that bathroom in the morning, man, and let them tears out or come home at the end of the day because it's not always easy being a man. It's not always easy being a woman that love a man. And that record and the spirit of this album was made for those moments. And I, and I just thought it was high time that rap, in terms of what I'm rapping, that I let the superhero, Killer Mike, stand to the side and let the man, Michael, express all the, all the highs and lows and the peaks and the valleys because I know that you guys can relate. You mentioned your father being working class. I know your mother was a, a, a florist. Yep. Being a rap performer is a long uh, shot. shot from there. So how did their professional lives inform your sort of ambitions? Well, they were teenagers when they had me, thankfully. And I got two dads. My mom, I told her, I said, man, you got me two great dads. I have a bio and a non-bio dad. And, um, Thankfully, though, they were all smart enough to say, let her parents raise them. Um, because my grandmother was 44, my grandfather was 54 when I was born. And at that age, really, you're ready to start kicking it, smoking weed, drinking, taking trips to the Bahamas. Or, or you can say, I'm going to impart all the knowledge, wisdom, I, and understanding I have unto these three little children, me and my two sisters, two of my five sisters. And, um, you know, when, when you tell people who have to start young. My, my parents started young. When you, when you tell them, I'm going to be a rapper, you're going to get one of two responses. My dad's response, Big Mike, his original response was, you know, they call it starving artist for a reason, son. <laughs> and, and he's a working class man. His dad had died at 10 years old. He had raised his two sisters and brothers under him. He had to look at life in a very, very logical, what's really practical kind of way. It's what I thought, so I thought my dad didn't believe in me. And I put that as a chip on my shoulder. I didn't feel any ways about my dad. I was just like, and now I got a chip on my shoulder to show my dad. And my mom, I remember telling her, and I told my dad at 19 I was leaving Morehouse to be a rapper. I told my mom at nine I wanted to be a rapper. She was like, <laughs> she was like, we rapping in, little and, 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 you know, if you knew Denise, she's not one to dap your dreams. Now, she wasn't going to put you in the studio. She wasn't going to get you no head shots and march you around. But if you said you wanted to be a fucking rapper, you wanted to go to Fresh Fest, I'm dropping your ass off at the Fresh Fest. Come out rapping. You know what I mean? she come downstairs, her and the homegirls, he's smoking joints. Rap for them. Rap for them, Michael. Rap, rap. And I'm like, Mom, I don't want to. Rap. You said you wanted to rap. <laughs> and um, so her encouragement <clears throat> propelled me to say, I can do anything. Because her parents were working class folks, dump truck driver nurse, her parents were, you go to work every day, you punch the clock. And with her though, she was free. My mother was an artist and a drug trafficker later, but you know. <laughs> but my dad and that challenge probably helped me because I needed to prove something to him. And, or I thought I did. And then about six years ago, he hits me, I was one of, it was one of Sanders campaign, I think the second time around, he hits me where I get described as a leader in an article. Now I'd been used to being a leader, since I was 15, I've been an organizer, you know what I mean? I didn't think anything special. I just thought, my grandmother told me, you do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, my dad says to me, he says, I know I hurt your feelings a long time ago when I said they call it starving artists for a reason. He said, 
it's not that I didn't believe in you as, a, as an artist, as a rapper. He says, this article describes my son as a leader and an asset to his people. And from the time I saw you in nursery, when me and the teacher would leave out the room, you tell the kids, I have an idea. This is what we're going to do. And if we stayed out there long enough, they were doing it. He said, I always saw my son as a leader. And man, it f***ed me up. Me and his light skin crying on the phone together. <laughs> and he said, son, I'd never been able to properly express to you that ultimately that's what you are. You are a leader. And I, I never doubted you could be a great rapper, but I never wanted you to negate leadership when called upon because you've been built for it. And man, it f***ed me up because I always thought my dad just thought I was a lazy, dumb boy, just like I think about my boys. <laughs> but, but indeed, I can stand back and know that my two boys are leaders, and in big part for the example that they've had with the group of men around them, from their uncles to their dads to their granddads, and I benefited from that same ecosystem. So thank my mom for encouraging me with a joint in her mouth. Thank my dad for, for not knowing how to express. I see you as a leader and giving me a chip on the shoulder because whether it's the tragedy or the triumphs, it pushes you further out of the valley into the peak of the mountain. So I'm very glad those two teenagers figured it out. So, you know, you, you mentioned this sort of dichotomy between your parents, and, and I, when I look at sort of the canon of your catalog, there is this sort of yin and yang quality to yeah. all of your work. Um, and you mentioned being a, a teenage activist and organizer. Yeah. And so at 15, you are leading a, a community organization. Yeah, Black Teens for Advancement. And by 19 or 18, yeah. you are at Morehouse and going to have a conversation with your mom about selling dope. Yes, yeah, so well, selling mid weed. Okay. Yeah, so at, at the time, East, East Hampton had just got a flood of Texas mid. It was just a bunch of guys mid and they were selling the bag so big. I'm just like, I can't miss out on this. These boys getting the whole bag. <laughs> they getting the bag for 550. They paying 750 on the west side. I'm at Morehouse, everybody's scared to leave campus. Huh? They want to smoke. I'm like, I got an idea. F this UPS, I'm the weed man. <laughs> so as an organizer with black men in particular, I understood that the violence needed to stop. So I was organizing at 15 around black teens for advancement, kids for change, trying to thwart the violence that was popping. But everybody was smoking weed. And I'm just like, man, I can't miss this. And my mom took me to my unsent house, and my unsent boyfriend had a Texas plug, and my mom laid down some rules. She said, look, if Michael comes to you, give it to him at 200 above cost only. Put a ceiling. Don't front him And I'm looking at her like, what the you mean? I'm like, I'm like, he just fronted all my cousins. Like, and for y'all don't know what it is, a front is when someone gives you something and then they put, they put a cap on it, then you're going to bring them their money back and they're going to look a little extra. I asked my mom, we left. I'm like, why? I could just get one. Why? She said, because you're not nobody's. You're not a prostitute and you don't work for nobody. You're not going, if you're going to be a dope dealer, it's going to be your dope. And I, um, and I thank her for that because when I decided to go independent, I had to have a conversation with myself. It wasn't that anybody was using and abusing me. Dungeon Family has done fairer business than probably any other people in the music industry in terms of not, not strangulating people with, you know, publishing deals and shit like that. But it taught me that I could go to sleep at night if I was hungry and it was my dope I was selling. I couldn't go to sleep at night with another man's dope. So music I took like that. I can, I can deal with failure if it's the album I wanted to make. But I couldn't let Adidas be my last single. I don't drink about sex, uh, sex every day. I got a fine wife. I wake up to sex. <laughs> <laughs> and I've dated a lot of big booty girls. <laughs> I think about being the better me, being the best I can for myself and my community. So I had to figure out a way that my legacy was not so attached to being a protege of the world's greatest rap group and more of the individual that they saw fit to sign. I wanted to come home. You know, I was raised in a church by my grandmother, and this church had an amazing band. The same guys that would play at the clubs that my mom went to on Saturdays, their moms belonged to this church, so they would come and they'd play at this church too. So the music was just so good that I wanted my music to feel like that. I spent my life chasing hip hop and them singing and rapping, and it took me away from home. And 
you know, musically to return home means to return to the roots that my love for music started even before hip hop. As a rapper even, I'm just an extension of the black musical experience in this country. I'm not different, I'm not an alternative to, I'm an extension of all that music. So I'm coming home. You mentioned getting into music and, and starting to pursue that more seriously. Yeah. And when you talk to young artists, one of the sort of hurdles that is the most intimidating for people, and what, this is whether they're fine artists, writers, musicians, is landing upon a personal style. Yeah. And when I think of you and, and those early records from Snapping and Trapping to yeah. Whole World, you had a very unique swing that was instantly recognizable. Yeah. What was your process for developing that? And when was the moment that you knew you had your thing? I can ride any beat. I'm, 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 I, what I don't get a lot of credit for because they don't discuss it in rap much is who can style switch. KRS-One, one of the best style yes. switches ever. Fact. When you look at, when you, when, when you, when you look at, when you look at CeeLo Green, CeeLo Green can be eight different MCs. Listen to CeeLo on the, on the Soul Assassin soundtrack. And then listen to CeeLo on the good in my back. Like, so for me, I wanted to be able to mess the styles. And then when you're rapping with Outkast, you never know what's coming out the beat machine. I just know I didn't want to be last in the line. I wanted to be first in line. So I didn't give a f it was the whole world, old girl for show curl. This sh getting rapped on. <laughs> what it took me longer to do was, because people, you go listen to the Good Morning record with me, Pusha T, and, and Black Thought. You hear a radically different style different what you hear on the whole world or what you hear on Never Scared or what you hear on any, any other. I try, to, I try to be tailor fit for this, but in terms of finding Michael's style, I've always been chasing what I found in this album. I'd always been running from church. You know, I'm one of them church boys, right? I've, I've been running, my grandma said, you, you, you can't keep running from the Lord. And I'd always ran from the music and groove that I loved trying to find it somewhere else trying to find it in East Coast samples, trying to find it in West Coast versions of funk samples. And what I had to do was come home. I had to come home, sit still, go in no face, no case studios, get my, get my exercise up so, okay, I'm confident I can do this. Go to Stankonia where it all started for me. Reconnect spiritually with that booth. Reconnect spiritually with that room. Ray Murray has been such a tremendous help in making this album. Ray didn't even land a beat on the album. He would just come in there, sit with me and Cuz, listen, say, uh, change the drums. Drums too East Coasty. That's not what you're doing. You're trying to make a Southern album. He never stopped reminding us the entire process. You are Southern. I don't give a f how famous you then became doing rap that people would consider beat by, um, in some way hip hop based. And when I say hip hop, you know, it's Atlanta cold word for New York. Um, <laughs> you are Southern. And he, he challenged us on that. And the more I got into the music that reminded me of the, magician, the musicians in the little Pentecostal churches my grandmother would take us to, the more I got around the music that reminded me of Curtis Mayfield, of the Isleys, of the music that my mom would listen to with me, the more I, I felt finally I found me in this style. When me and Cuz went out to LA, I felt like we had one of the greatest mixtapes in the world and then No ID was like, man, I've been waiting for you to finally decide to come out here. So now we're gonna show you how to take these great thoughts and ideas you have and put them with the people to help bring them fully to life. And to basically go back to church. This is the story of a, a prodigal son. You know, I was raised in the deep south. I was raised right, as the old folks say. I got caught up in the streets, as the old folks say. You know, I took the gospel to the streets and the streets taught me something to go back to church and pray about. But the sound is definitely out of the spirit of the south. It's definitely out of the spirit of church and soul. You know, I would have liked to have made Pimp C proud. I would like for him to call this a country rap tune, you know? I, I'm trying my best to, to show in homage what Ball and G have meant to me musically, what Outkast has meant to me musically. You know, I'm trying my best to show what Suave House and rap a lot, Luke Skywalker records, how they influenced me, and at the same time, give people a brand new version, stripped down, naked in the middle of a church. This is Michael. This is Michael at a christening as a baby. You know, my sister, um, Sharika, sent me a picture of myself at one week old a couple days ago, and I was like, wow, this little bitty fragile little human being on this mattress has grown into a man. It has his own little human beings now and is responsible for people and staff. So for me, this music is the homecoming of a prodigal son. When you talk about chasing your sound for your entire career, yeah. I'm curious about, at, at the outset of your career, you had 
one of the most phenomenal rookie seasons I think of any artist. I had a good one. Yeah. You had a Grammy for your first single yep. uh, with Whole World, and you had two songs with Jay Z. Yeah. Um, and then you put out uh, Monster at the height of Outkast, yeah, sort of pinnacle. I'm curious when you reflect back, do you feel like you were ready for that platform? I don't reflect back because that's how you turn into a pillar of salt. You know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a story out of, of Lot's wife, where as God had angels destroying the city, the only commandment he told him was don't look back. And you know, you get curious, God, why are you telling me? <laughs> but it brings the bitterness, it brings the, the ego and the insecurity out in you. So I never looked back. All I did was kept going forward. I, I appreciated the rookie season. I, you know, like I remember somebody tried to insult me, like the only reason you got a Grammy is you're on a song with Outkast. I said, I had the wickedest verse on that mother. <laughs> Cause what you not gonna do is not tell me I'm a bad rapper. You go listen to Papa Tags. I originally was directly behind Jay-Z. Somebody chopped it and pushed my down one more and say, let's get twisted in between this. Cause I was rapping my ass off. I went, I went to go listen to Good Morning with Pusha T and Black Dog. Rap my ass off and somebody changed their verse and I ain't gonna tell you who. I'm here to... When, when it, when it comes to humility, time we get on that track, that shit is out the dope. So did I have a phenomenal rookie? D absolutely. Was it dope? Yes. It was 50 cents time in that time. We dropped the same as 2003 when we dropped, and it was just like I saw the wave coming like, oh, shit, this is going to be unstoppable. But I knew I had made enough marks. I think it was it Dave McPherson bear that used to be at Columbia? Was it Dave McPherson? Yeah, yeah Dave sat me down and taught me about a P&L sheet. He said, look, this is your album. This is how much you've sold. You have made the company money. They're now gonna move the rest of your budget to Vivian Green. <laughs> I was like, I like Vivian, but I would have liked to kept my money, dog." <laughs> and and um, once I understood that concept, I said, okay, I know I can go make independent records. And I went down to Texas, and thanks to people like Lil Flip, Slim Thug, Zero, Trey, The Grit Boys, Chameleon Air and Paul Wall, they showed my crew grind time how to press and sell records independently. So that's what took me through the next seven, eight years of figuring myself out because I didn't want to lose an opportunity. Now I know a big company's only bet on you so many times, but I knew if I could prove myself independently, then when I got ready, that stage would be there for me. And you know, it's amazing what you learn having to do it yourself because it made me a lot more empathetic to Big and Dre. You know, I wasn't no resentful artist. They didn't do everything they could do for me. You know, that's stupid shit. They did as artists, everything they could possibly do within their range, and then they, they hit the end of their range. They were still artists at their peak. You could only expect, and it wasn't until I got responsible for some other people that I understood, oh, it's not easy being a boss. To be a boss, you gotta have a staff. And to have a staff, you gotta make payroll. And to make payroll, you gotta make profit. And if you're not making profit, you're not in business, you're just bullshit. So, of course. for me, for me, once I, once I understood those principles I got with SMC, where I met a guy who would become my manager, Will Bronson, once I further learned what the independent game was, and me and L hooked up, thanks to Jason DeMarco, and all this is hometown stuff, right? So Jason DeMarco works at um, Turner, he works at Cartoon Network, he knows me and L, he says, hey, Mike Bigger, I'd like for you to make a record as Killer Mike again, and make your America's Most Wanted. Boom, 11 years ago, you get rap music, we do a mixtape called Run the Jewels. That mixtape, I know it's instantly magic. I'm like, I ain't never letting this white boy from around me. It's me and him. This is us, baby. It's we, 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 are, we are a goddamn team. This is, this, is, um, this, is, this, is, this is like, man, this is magic. And when me and L made Run the Jewels two, three, and four, I knew that we had finally completed what I wanted us to be a true group. You gotta have four classic records. Outkast set that precedent. Goody Mob set this precedent for us. Like, you got to have back to back to back Man, I just sat and was just like, wow, we've done it. Let's work on Run the Jewels 5. <laughs> and then a pandemic help happens and we can't tour and work. Um, he gets a movie soundtrack for an Air, uh, um, Al Capone movie. It's amazing thing he does musically, him and Zach were working. And me and Cuz just got in the room and started hashing shit out. And before you know it, Michael happens. And in the process of making Michael, I learned how to become a better business person. But what I learned is how to be an artist in the sense of trusting my instincts, going with my confidence, t taking a mistake and making that mistake something else. I really learned and I got in tune with myself in a different way. So thanks to Cuz Lightyear A&R and then me and him treating it like a job. We go in at 10 at night, 
We go out to five to six in the morning and record. We go home, go to sleep. We take weekends off. And the more I lived my recording life like a regular worker class guy, the better the music came out on the other side. So for the rest of my life, this is how I record. As a Southern man, you're taught a lot of times that the greater good of the family is what's important. And you know, that you have to compartmentalize certain things because as a man, you gotta lead a family. And since I've been a nine year old boy, I wanted to be a rapper. But in becoming that and becoming and growing into being, you know, not only an MC, I faced a lot of challenges. So I think that this record is distinctly black male and Southern and working class man. And for the women who love them, be they their mothers, their lovers, their wives, their daughters, their sisters, you know, I think that this record embraces masculinity and it embraces um, the hugeness of the ego and the fragility of it all at one time. We talked about you putting out your first record sort of at this peak of outcast madness. Yeah. Um, but very quickly, the uh, sand beneath your feet starts to shift yeah. as the group splinters and you end up uh, sort of rolling with Big Boy in the divorce. Yeah, it, well, it wasn't a divorce. It, 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 I mean, they've never stopped being friends. The group has never ended. It's that, that as a musician, as an artist, man, imagine always getting it right. You know what I'm saying? You, you like, you know, you have to find new things to conquer and Dre wanted to find new things to conquer. And I believe everybody in the dungeon loved him and believed him and still does. You know, Tip, one of the greatest hit makers out of this town I've ever seen, motherfucker going around making people laugh now. You know, he's like, shit, I made hit records 20 years. I want to see what else I can conquer. So it wasn't a divorce like that. But Big Boy um, must be accredited with being one of the best business minds in this game. And he understood what he had in a Michael Render and a Janelle Monet. And he understood that those two artists who are coming out within weeks of each other, I didn't have tits to show, but God, <laughs> Janelle, yes. The music, music and the breasts, both A1. Um, both A1. Um, <laughs> I see what you did there. So Big dedicated himself to making sure that the artist didn't feel abandoned, even if he may have at the time. And I don't think that oftentimes he's accredited with not only being the astute businessman he is, but just being the guy that kept shit together. And, and I appreciate him for that. And, and there have been so many times post our headbutting of one another that I just call him in the middle of the night and say, thank you. You know, thank you for giving me an opportunity to change my life. Thank you for the advice. Thank you. Because Big had another deal for me. He, Jermaine had went over to Virgin. Um, Jermaine was like, look, I'll give you this much money. Um, and I was like, nah, I'm cool. He was like, I'll give you this much money. And then he, he hit me to he he West Side. He said, I'll give you this much money, I'll give you a, a Dodge with the Hemi. And I said, I said, damn, that's tempting. But nah. <laughs> and, you know, in big part, they wanted me to come after Bubba Sparks and Sleepy Brown who I have an enormous amount of respect for both of those artists, I had just gotten to the point where I wasn't really just standing in line anymore and wait. And um, I know Big thought I was crazy. Bear, who's in here with me, thought I was insane. And me and Cuz Lightyear and the rest of the Grind Time crew went and slept on the floor in Gwinnett County. Big Key gave us his house. Um, all the music equipment that I had bought from selling drugs, Karma came and kicked me in the ass because the people I was originally doing music with, shout, shouts out to my, my daughter's uncle, he sold my equipment and I was just like you mother and um but with that said it made me work harder because we slept on big keys for we produced grind time one next thing you know grind times two some SMC um and then pledge so pledge one two and three I, I learned by having to be big boy by having to be the guy that kept shit together I learned to empathize and not to let apathy set in and anger and bullshit that we've seen so many great artists and their mentors go through, you know what I mean? And it gave me an opportunity to come back and apologize and say, I was wrong. You know, not wrong about doing it independently, but I was wrong in not understanding what you were going through. I was wrong in selfishly thinking, what about me? As you were splintering at that time, not divorcing, but the group was splintering. You, like, imagine, man, you worked all this time just to get to the point where you finally see the break of day, because business works like that. You work a lot of nights on nobody see before the big thing happens, and right as the big thing is happening, his brother, his friend, his partner says, I want to pursue something else. So it, it, it grew me as a human being. Yeah, and, um, and, and, and the, the saying did get shaky, 
but I wasn't selling dope no more. You know, if you listen to Monster, there's a record on there produced by DJ Swift, who's downstairs keeping a tune, it's called Scared Straight, and it's, Mama, I don't want to sell dope no more. That's really where I was in my life. I did not want to be in, because I knew I'm too intelligent, these motherfuckers can smell me from a mile away, and I'm not supposed to be out here no more, and they're going to kill me. Like, that, and that was, that was just it. I remember when Swift called me. Anaya had to have been four years old. My daughter's in here today. He says, you have to move out of Adamsville. I said, man, I'm in the last set of townhouses on MLK. Sleep around the corner, ain't nobody gonna bother me. He said, no, nah, you got to go. You don't understand how big you are. We moved, and I remember telling a little red kid who used to be over there, I said, hey man, you need to stop coming through here because you're not even from here, you're from Decatur. I say, they, 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 if they'll do it to me, they're certainly gonna do it to you. <laughs> Two weeks later, he was tied up in a trunk with, with iron burns with his dad demanded $20,000 for his ransom. And he got out of it alive, but I hit Swift and I told Swift and he said, I told you. And um, he's always been a big brother like that to me. So I started to understand that even with the sand slipping, even with the quicksand, that I still had a chance. I just couldn't stop my legs from moving. I had to keep going. And, that, and that's really the only thing that's brought me here, because I've been a dope rapper, I've been talented, I've been willing to learn and make every album better, but it was the getting up and putting one foot in front of the other every single day. I'm not going to quit. I have to figure this shit out. So everything from CeeLo's first encouragement when I was 19 to my wife's telling to me, you got to get your depressed ass out of this bed and go do this show in Mobile, Alabama for this thousand goddamn dollars because they need to know your name even though you'll be able to spend the money on a rental car. You know, and I did it. So I had a lot of encouragers around me. I had a lot of people around me that said, we don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. And that's what I did. I just got up every day and worked every day. You talk about the Pledge of Allegiance uh, mixtape series. Yeah. And on that first one, there's a record, Bad Day, Worst Day. Yeah. And for me, as a fan who had enjoyed Monster and enjoyed your contributions to Outkast, that third verse was a statement of purpose and uh, a really coherent articulation of, of what you were about in a way that I had never heard leading up to that. And I'm, I'm curious, sort of, what was it what was the context that sort of led you to that moment? I just, I wanted to, in those days, Atlanta wasn't given a lot of credit for being a, a city of lyricism. They made Outkast and Goody Mob exceptions. And they talked about us like there wasn't a rule that, that we could go. And my thing is, man, I'm in a crew with Dre. I'm in a crew with CeeLo. You know, I'm in a crew with Stylistically. Big Boy flips. Big Boy is not given the credit that we adorn, say, a Lil Wayne for. Lil Wayne is one of the most style-flipping motherfuckers I've ever heard. The first three albums with Big Boy, I said, I couldn't catch up with his style. It's, I was, you hear me on the whole world, I'm just trying to figure out a pattern, and once I lock it, I know I got it, because I'm like, I know he coming behind me, so I can't bullshit. For, for me, that song was a line in the sand to say, nah, motherfucker, this is me. This is me, this is who I am, this real raw rap shit about is what I'm about, and I wanted to get the greatest compliments you can get from a rap fan in Atlanta. Boy, that's hard. <laughs> that, 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 that is the best, like, like if, if an Atlanta guy ever said, if you, if you got put on a dress, ladies, and you say, what do you think an Atlanta dude looks, you say, that's hard. He ain't talking about his zipper. He like, your dress is the best dress in the room. So when I got that, after that record, Bad Day, Worst Day, I'm like, I'm never looking back. Like, I'm never looking back. I'm gonna figure me out, but I'm never gonna stop coming hard. I'm never gonna, you know, it's like MJG. MJG been rapping 30 years. I ain't heard an unhard MJG verse <laughs> yet. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, MJG said, God damn, when he was on Bad Boy, he said, hurry up, get, hurry up, cut off the grits they done. I wanna see you on your toes so they blister song. That was his third inclination of MJG. I'm like, I wanna be hard. When my beard fully gray, I want my look at me like, hey, he going just as hard as he did on snapping and trapping. So for me, that set a bar for me. You know, let me know. Snap and trap every time. So during that period, you know, you've talked about creating- Oh, I'm sorry, bad day, oh. worst day, I apologize. Uh, you, you talked about creating from a place of desperation because you're trying to figure out how to make it connect. Yes. And, and I'm curious, how did that desperation and that search change the art? Well, it changed the man. It grew me up. I didn't have a label to depend on. I didn't have a manager I can call to say, I need you to front me. I didn't have favors. And I tell people that Grind Time is a collective. We went to college in Texas. You know, I remember getting to Texas and Paul and Chameleon there, even the guys that didn't fuck with each other fucked with us. Even if they didn't fuck with each other, they said, yeah, we'll fuck with you tomorrow. We don't fuck with who you with today. You know, we like, all right. <laughs> but they, they showed us 
what a focused community building rap life. The time in Texas helped me understand Run the Jewels because it helped me understand I didn't need all the fluff. I wanted it like this part of fluff. This is great. Air conditioning, right? <laughs> a car picked me up from my building. Amazing shit. But them boys would drive their cars to the CD plants, press up their CDs. I remember Paul, and I probably shouldn't have did this, but I needed it. I needed the bark all the time. Paul was like, man, shit, you can just use one of my bark holes. And so I'm like, I'm sure a lot of them Paul Wall scans and some grind time scans too. But they showed us, man, and that methodology took, I brought back as we dropped tapes off on the way back. It, it just changed me. It changed me as a man because I knew whether I ate or whether I lived or died, it was on me. It changed me as a musician because I understood that I needed, I needed, to, to, I needed to be like water. I needed to be able to meld with the time. Slim Thug was dope when I met him 15 years ago. Slim Thug is dope now. Slim Thug was dope when he was on Star Trek. Slim Thug doing just as many shows, got just as many calls, doing that right now because he's never stopped that purpose. So for me, man, keep the purpose and the music is gonna grow with you. Miles Davis, or I'll give you Buddy Guy. I grew up listening to Buddy Guy. I love Buddy Guy because my granddad listened to Buddy Guy. I bought Buddy Guy's Sweet Tea. It's his last album I ever bought for my grandfather. It was totally different. It was more rock oriented. It was darker. Me and my granddad rode and listened to it together. He in turn liked it too. But it showed me if this 50, 60 year old man has the ability to keep evolving, who am I not to evolve? Musically, you know, as a man. So what it did was, yeah, it, it, it evolved me musically because again, I was on a hunt for the sound I finally found. And now that I found that sound, what you hear even toward the end of this record when High and Holy, I'm taking into the next record because I wanted to get bigger, better, more bad, more truth field you know, more joy feel, more transparency. So it, it's a grown me as a man and as an artist, if you grow, it's going to show in your work. As an artist, if you grow, it's going to show, whether it's poetry or visual arts or music, if you really grow, then you, you, you can't stay in the container that's most comfortable. You can't stay in the same style you've had. There's a lot of people can wrap their ass off and I can imitate their style because it's the only style they know. I, Scarface, I seen him do it to Willie D. They were going back and forth. He said, Willie, I'll kill you in a verse. And Willie said, man, no. Nah. And Face starts doing Willie's style. That's dangerous, you know? So I want to be that dangerous. During that period also, you, you really double down sonically on uh, very street Atlanta sound. Yes. And then in 2010, you meet LP. Yes. And of course, now four years later and lots of festival shows and tours, it seems like it, an obvious and incredible marriage. Yep. But in that moment, you were in a challenged place. L was also had just shut down D Def Jux and yeah. also was not, you know, in sort of peak uh, yeah. career moment. And I'm curious what animated your decision to completely pivot your career? I, I knew it was right. Jason DeMarco from William Street Records Cartoon Network put us in the same room together. L brought out the first four beats he brought out, I rapped on. Big Beast, which ended up me and me, T.I. and Bunby was, the, I think, the first record. I rapped on you, I don't, you know, out, out, of, out of all the loves you've loved, you don't know why you love that love that you love. But I knew instantly, man, I'm in love with this man. This mother beast is crazy. And, and I'm running around the room, because I knew about him and Dev Jux in the peripheral. He knew about me in the peripheral. But in that room, I called Jason within three hours. I said, you got to get him to do the whole album. I said, you gotta do it. And I started telling, yo, you gotta do the whole album. Nah, man, I'm finishing my own albums. Man, f all that shit, dog. <laughs> no, you doing my whole album. Jason went and found the money. Jason went and, and got him to do the album. By the time we had made it up to Brooklyn to record, me and L had become friends, almost in a brother-like way over our bun for hip hop. By the time the album was friend, this is my brother. Like, I don't give a f what kind of day you have. And I don't give a f we just fought. If you put your hands on them, elementary school rules apply, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. You know what I mean? This is my brother, I love him. So it was an Ice Cube discovers Bomb Squad moment. You know, I knew that I was born to rock over these beats. Now, when it came time to do the mixtape on the Jewels, L was like, you know, L had already got paid to do the tape. The company's like, where's our tape? And um, it took L a long time to write. But what I noticed in the room together, the writing happened quick. We had done a song together because his beats just inspired the shit out of me. And stylistically, I like the challenge. I grew up on just as much brand Nubian as I did Dell and the Hieroglyphics, as I did Ice Cube and NWA, as I did Ghetto Boys. So stylistically, it's easy for me to figure out where I am, but I knew my style was perfect. My aggressive style was perfect for what me and L were doing. So we did, I told L, I said, hey man, I'm gonna come up and do the mixtape with you. He was like, man, I ain't got no money. I said, I ain't asked you about no goddamn money. 
let's just do the tape. Because I knew if I did the tape, we could go back on the road. If I go on the road, I can afford to feed my children. So we start operating like a punk or a rock band. And we put the tape out, and we were performing, and we, we came out opening for each other. So I come out, Ella come out, people are like, yeah, DF, yeah, yeah. People come out, Def Chuck, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just be these kids that off to the right with like X's on their hands. So you could tell they weren't drink, they were kids. And they just stand there and look at us like, yeah, okay, that's right, OG, get it, legend, all that shit, all right? And then we come out as Run the Jewels, and those kids would act like they had never seen us, not even 15 minutes before, and lose their <laughs> mind. And I, was, I just remember being on stage sometimes like, oh, sh this is going to get, and then we start getting calls. Well, the 500-seat venue we're going to do, and we're upping it to eight. The 800-seat venue has been up to 1,500. And before you know it, Run the Jewels 2 comes around, and it's, it's, I remember getting off the bus, and um, an old member of the team who's no longer with me, he was saying, um, you know, what, what we're going to go home and, and get to work. I said, no, I'm in a group now. I'm not going home getting to work. I got a, I got a four album mandate. We got to do this to be the group I want us to be. And, and, and I dedicated the next decade, you know, to run the jewels. When you look at big boy song, Kill Gio, and I come on, Polo to the Floto. That was originally a song one of my partners brought me, Pretty Ken, shouts out to PK. He said, you need this beat, this fat boy, this going to take you through the roof. But I'm like, I can't go through the roof without my dog. I have to be more dedicated to the group at that. So I took it to Big, because I knew if I got a chance to tour, I had learned the advantage of touring. I said, I could go out on the road with Big, worst case scenario. And so I was very selfless in understanding my dedication had to be to run the jewels. And with COVID coming, it just gave me enough time to shrug my shoulders and say, what the f let me try this solo thing again. I got some stuff to say. Well, having had close proximity to the challenges of being in a group, I'm curious if you were, you know, talking to a young artist who is in a group, what is the key to navigating that relationship and, and keeping Oh, things? man, my, um, my assistant, um, Rhonda Burnham, gave me some great advice. Do good music, go out there, have a bitch of fun on the road, leave the road and don't call each other and let everybody decompress. Because you need to go live your life and be with the other people who you're doing it for and their influences so you truly appreciate the comeback together when it's not out of a desperate place or not of a place of obligation. And thank God, Elle and I were old enough that when we started working that our egos and insecurities we had already kind of put to the side. We'd already been shamed, blamed. We'd already been tied to the whipping post. We'd already, you know, every, every fear that could have happened that happened. So we just came as two pure artists enjoying the process together. And I think that ultimately, that's what the success of Run the Jewels is. Beyond the music is the genuine love and authentic friendship that we share in brotherhood bond. And that's why Michael is not something that's outside of Run the Jewels. Run the Jewels is the uncanny X-Men. Any group of characters might pop up. Me and LP pop up, Zach De La Roca pops up, God Bless the Dead Gangsta Boo pops up, Josh Homme, Marvin Staples. Anybody, Two Chains popped up high that mother rapping with us. Um, but, the, 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 the pre-story to the superhero Killer Mike is a part of the Run the Jewels universe. It's like Logan to Wolverine. So this only helps you understand when you hear a line, when I say, you know, when my mother transitioned to another plane, I was sitting on a plane telling her to hold on, she's tried hard, but she just couldn't hang. Every Run the Jewel fan knows that lyric, but when you hear Michael say, my mama's dead, my grandmama's dead, to keep it honest, I get depressed and be feeling scared. That is a radically different feeling because you are hearing the totality and the weight of a man who says, I'll never see her. You know, I'll never see Denise again. I'll never see Betty again. And that's a much heavier lyric to say than my mother's transition or my mother's left me. And I'm blessed that, that the Run the Jewels universe have put me on a platform where I could comfortably spend a half a million dollars of my own money behind my wife's back recording a record. <laughs> that conversation didn't go over very well. But um, until I told the white folks they had to pay me back. <laughs> but that, that um, I never would have gotten a chance to say those words had Run the Jewels not provided this amazing universe for me to be a part of. I never would have financially been able to bear that burden had Run the Jewels not given me an opportunity to tour and to build. So I'm forever thankful for the half of the group I am. And my group, I want to be rocking until we 70, 80 years old. I want to go in the Hall of Fame for rock and roll as one half of Run the Jewels and a bad solo artist as well. So I got big goals in the next 20 years to accomplish. I've read a quote by Malcolm recently that said, I want to be remembered as sincere. I'm not always going to be right, but God, 
and I was sincere. I was asked a question. Uh, people looked at you funny after you spoke three years ago to, to quail the wires. And I was like, well, where are you from? You from Atlanta? And the person said, no. I said, I wasn't talking to you. You have no concept of what the f I'm even saying. So when I gave that speech, it wasn't for you. It was for Atlantans because where the fires were going to happen, if you pivoted a half a mile to the left, you'd be burning down an entire black neighborhood called a bluff in Vine City and Dixie Hills and Center Hill and Collier Heights and Adamsville. So, you know, that's just that. I've, I've learned that I'm going to be a hero to some and a villain to others, and, I, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm curious about talking that shit. Yeah. Uh, clearly, you uh, had some things to get off your chest. Got right. And, and I'm curious because, you, you know, when you leaned into politics, um, I would say starting around uh, the death of Mike Brown and then yeah. really crescendoing a, as a surrogate for Bernie Sanders during yeah. the 2016 campaign, you were lauded, broadly speaking, by the left. Yeah, yeah. And in the subsequent years, you came under scrutiny from them. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of that is uh, reflected in that record. What was sort of the inciting moment that you just said, this is bullshit, I have to respond? Well, talking that shit is about everybody. You know, how, you know how you might say something on Twitter like, hey man, I, I, really like my, my, I really like my yard. Hey man, you shouldn't cut your yard. You should let it grow wild. And people just have opinions on your shit. For a few years, just everybody was attacking me. Conservatives were attacking me. Liberals were attacking me. Black folks attacking me. Bad wig mafia wanted my head. Other, I, I, some woman who's an Emmy nominated actress, I'm gonna use my platform to take it. I'm just like, you're nominated, honey. I'm a Grammy winner. You don't have a, blame, a bigger platform. Like, <laughs> like, like, yeah, like don't, don't do that. Let's focus on winning your Emmy so we can say, hey, girl, you did it, right? But this record is just for all the motherfuckers that wanna talk shit because I know what I'm talking about. I, I'm not, I am the product of black people having a successful ecosystem out of the Collier Heights. I'm the product of fine black teachers from Collier Heights to Frederick Douglass High School to Morehouse College. I'm the product, good, bad, and ugly of us. So I don't take us lightly. I don't take money from white folks to campaign for them. I don't take money from black folks to campaign for them. I don't take money from lobby groups to campaign. So if I do it, I do it with sincerity. If I'm wrong, I sincerely apologize, but this record, was about fighting on Twitter, arguing with you on IG. Let me see if you can out rap me, God. You know, you can't, you can't meet every argument on the Twitter <laughs> because they're not real. And what is real is as I walk through this city, if I'm in Carver Homes, if I'm in Joyland, if I'm in Johns Creek, if I'm in Alpharetta, I get stopped multiple times a day by multiple ethnicities, multiple religions, multiple class to say thank you. Thank you for what you do locally. And if I am doing what I, my grandmother did locally, I'm doing my job. I'm not somebody who got to be a celebrity and start feeling guilty and all of a sudden I wanted to save poor children across the world and figure out how to not have turtles die from straws and shit. <laughs> all that is important work, but it's not more important than what I do at Frederick Douglass High School. It is not more important than what I do on my side of town to my neighbors to the left and right because that's what's real. That's what I saw my grandparents do. So, you know, I, I appreciate that actress for her enthusiasm. But if your enthusiasm only pop up every two to four years, sister, you just acting. You know, this is what I do every single day. Every single day, there is something that pops up on my radar that I can help with locally and I try to help. And if I'm not helping with what you want to help me with locally, then you aren't at my me neither. You can't be mad at me. You know, a lot of people say, well, where are you on this particular issue? Well, I'm right where I was. I'm with the Next Level Boys Academy, making sure these boys don't go to jail for 30 and 40 years. I'm with Georgia Youth Bill, making sure that the same groups of boys have a trade, that they will get paid union scale for working for Tyler Perry. I'm doing the same work I've done the last 30, 40 years of my life. What are you doing? I say 30, 40, I'm only 48 year old man, because I've been working in politics since my grandmother drugged my little black ass along the pair of homes to knock on people's door to get them to vote for Andy Young. I've been... I have, I have had a duel of the ability to see duality in black people since my grandmother, who was a staunch SCLC member, NAACP member, staunch, staunch marcher, versus my grandfather, who was simply just an independent black man. You probably label him a libertarian. His thing was, and he would say this, is God gave you the good brains that when you had an appetite to make a fishing pole and catch a fish, then what the hell should the government ask you for $5 for tax to fish for, for a license? And I said, God. That made a lot of sense, right? 
And then my grandmama yelled from the kitchen some shit like, well, well, if, 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 if you don't have to pay, who gonna clean up the parks? That's what they pay the bang warden for. So somewhere in the middle of those extremes for Michael, if a group of people who are only 60 years free volunteer to give a government that they are comparing to Nazis their guns back, that is the stupidest shit you could possibly do. And any leader, any leader who looks like you that tells you to do that, I'm going to say that's stupid. Now, the leader might not be stupid, but that's a stupid goddamn idea. Well, Martin never marched with guns. The deacons of defense did, and they bodyguarded him. It's just time, the same way we want white folks to learn the whole truth about history in elementary school, it's time we start to admit some history, and that's true too. So when I look at politically like a controversial thing, like the NRA is controversial, the NRA sided with Reagan, the NRA helped enact gun laws against the Black Panthers, the NRA before that also helped Robert F. Williams start the first black gun chapter in North Carolina so he could defend himself. It's just a tool that we use. We done with the tool for the tool. Join the Bash Reeves Gun Club, join NAGA, but take your black outside and learn to shoot and stop sitting in your goddamn house watching the news acting like you're scared men take your ass on a fishing trip learn how to kill a piece of fish and stop paying 99 dollars for goddamn crab legs as fun david thinking that's fishing so i don't have the luxury of making everybody happy all the time <laughs> But what I do know is I'm sincere in my intentions. If I can help, I'm going to be there to help. But your criticism means about as much to me as I told you on that song. It don't mean shit. I rap better than you. So you can talk on Twitter all you want to. I'm gonna write a song about you, your mama, your punk neighborhood, your bad wig. And what, and what you're not gonna be able to do is out rap me. So I can accept the criticism because Maynard Jackson had to accept the criticism. Andy Young had to accept the criticism. Keisha Lance Bottoms, Andre's currently accept the criticism. If you only have seen black leadership in your life, you always know that some rainy days don't come with them sunny days. So I accept all the days, but I'm not going to get up and lie. And I'm not going to get up and sing and dance with white folks when it ain't paid to do a song. You seen me to sing and dance, it's gonna, it's, I'm not going to tell a lie to my people. I'm not going to be up this motherfucker talking about, well, we need to do more gun buybacks. Because I don't truly believe that. Now, if you want me to pay higher taxes, I'll pay my extra 10 cent if it's going to education. I can't pay an extra 10 cent to buy a bomb. If you want me to simply give the government more money to increase more warfare, I'm going to turn into a conservative quicker than your ass. No, 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 no. I'm going to turn more conservative than my wife. No, when I'm trying to buy an auto part. But if you start to pragmatically black people, I'm talking to black people now, if we start to handle this by a case by case basis, we'll do a lot better. If we get off the internet and get in our rooms with 10 or 15 of our friends and have real conversations and stop focusing on who's going to win the presidential election, who's your city council person? Okay. Right? Who, who's your county commissioner? Who's the judge that, vote, that you voted for? Who's the prosecutor? And if you don't know this, you don't know sh Not a god thing. Because whatever money your little president sending down never going to make it to you if that punk Congressman don't do his job. Whatever money your president send down ain't gonna work if you ain't talk to the governor to say, hey governor, when they got money come, that shit ain't just going south for Macon. You better save some for North of Macon and Atlanta too. But you got to be politically sophisticated enough and you don't have to go to Morehouse and take political education. Get your black ass in them neighborhood meetings like my grandmother did, bring your little beautiful black children and push the line. And we can disagree, but if I don't see you at the meeting, I don't give a fuck about nothing you saying. That's it. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I, I, you also, on the song, you mentioned Alonzo Hernda. Yes, and, yes, And yes, I'm curious you. about how you see the through line between him and Greenwood the bank that you've so, started. So, Al Alonzo Hardy, there are going to be a lot of names and stuff you hear on this album, and I want you to Google them. If you hear, like, you got to say, why do Mike keep talking about Herman Russell, right? Why does he keep talking about Alonzo Hearn and these people? Alonzo Hearn owned barber shops, and he owned black, the, the barbers in the shops were black, the constituency that came to the shop were white, but they were white businessmen in Atlanta, insurance agents, bankers, brokers. His community didn't have life insurance. 
He figured out a way to broker a deal to get life insurance policies from these companies and be the exclusive seller to black people and became Atlanta Life Insurance Company, provided jobs, provided commerce, provided an example of what to be. If I've grown up under this shadow, then how can I doubt myself? So when Andy Young, Bo Young, Paul Judge come to me, Ryan, and they say to me, hey, we think we have a fintech idea that can help people that are struggling because banks have pulled out and they have deserts, Greenwood made the most sense in the world. Is anything perfect? Is any bank going to be perfect? Any black bank, any white bank? Nope. Do you push it to perfection by demanding more, by pushing? Absolutely. Citizens Trust Bank is almost 100 years old. I got my Citizens Trust Bank card or check, first checkbook at five years old. My grandmother took me to get my Citizens Trust. My sisters had Citizens Trust to this day. I'm with them. Because I understand because of the Atlanta way that there is a need to always save something for yourself and your community. So do we, my grandparents always have a national bank? Yep, but all their Christmas and retirement money was Citizens Trust. My retirement fund, Citizens Trust, that's money I don't f with. I just send them $100,000 over there, I look at that shit in 20 years. Because I want that bank to be strong, because it, when it comes time for my daughter to need a loan to open her first paint shop building, I want her to be able to go to the bank so she can't hop to haul her daddy. I'm broke. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, you know, you talked about the success of Run the Jewels, and I think stepping away from something that is working so successfully is one of the scariest things that an artist or really any person in a commercial enterprise can yeah. possibly do. Uh, what was the sort of catalyst that made you want to create another solo record? Yeah, I, I don't think, I, well, I'd always promised I'd do it. I think it was time, time was right. A pandemic happened, the world stopped. You know, L had some work to do. I, I, I was like, sitting twiddling my fingers like, you know, because Lightyear, my A&R, and one of my best friends, like a brother, really was the nudge to kind of nudge me and say, hey, cuz, let's, let's, cuz we working on a mixtape together. We were on some evil, villainous shit. And um, he said, cuz, I'm gonna take a pause and I want you to do this. So keep good friends. Keep good people around you that want to see you blossom and be the best. And when they put their career on pause or their thing on pause, the only thing you owe them is hard work. So anybody, while I was making this record, if you came through the studio, gave us a pat on the back, if you brought a drink, if you brought the dancers from the blue flank, thank you. You know what I mean? I appreciate you. You have served to inspire me. So um, I don't see it. I see, well, I'm going to tell you what I don't, what I do see it as, Michael is an expansion of the Run the Jewels universe. I, I remember wondering why Wolverine was so goddamn grumpy. When I was, my dad would take me, my dad Tony would take me to the, in the West End when they still had the place. You know, your dad will take you, you can buy comic books, he's buying Playboy in the back of the, back of the um, store. You know, I'd be like, dad left me over with X-Men, dad get in that penthouse with Vanessa Williams. <laughs> I remember wondering why Wolverine was so grumpy, but then when I learned the story of Logan, how he was used and abused, how government experimented on them, I identified the same way that the writers of X-Men said they, they modeled um, Professor X after Martin and Magneto after Malcolm. And, and, and Wolverine I identified with truly his only mutation is, you know, he can heal fast, he has the claws that come out of his bones, but they put a metal in him, they tortured him. And that story endeared me more to him. I understood not only was he mean and grumpy, he loved the hell out of those kids that were mutants because he didn't want the same things to happen to them. So a lot of times the old man is talking bad to you in front of the store when you think you're a dope boy, it ain't because he hates you, it's because he loves you, because he sees himself in you. You know, that, that when you get admonished by a neighbor for something stupid, it's not because they don't like you or love you, it's because they do like you and love you and they see some of themselves in you and they've made the same mistakes. And ultimately this, this is an album, but it is a, it is a, a audio movie that is a testimonial. Of, of a native son and a prodigal son in this country, in these times. And I hope that, well, I know if you give it a listen, you're gonna come out of it feeling something. And I can't say a lot of music makes you feel anymore, but this album certainly is gonna make you feel something. I've been hunting this record for 20 years. I've been hunting trying to make it, didn't know how. So it is a memoir and a testimonial in the sense that it is the culmination of the life of this 48 year old man who had a dream as a nine-year-old kid, but he and this city have grown up together. He's grown up in times that other people, um, that it broke them. You know, the crack era broke a lot of people in half. As a kid who came up in that era, you experiment with bullshit like dealing and stuff, 
As a man, you grow empathy and you start to feel really guilty for shit you did when you're 15, 16 years old. So when you hear something for junkies, that's a record that I couldn't have done 15, 20 years ago because I didn't know how to do the record. You mentioned being able to go to sleep at night. And you know, one of the sort of through lines of this record is really you unpacking your own feelings about selling dope. And you hear it on, on Down By Law and you hear it on Something For The Junkies quite pointedly in a you know, uh, vignette that you tell about you and your aunt talking yeah, while yeah. she's so, smoking. So and, and when people hear about the cracker, I don't know how many people watch Snowfall or shit like that, but you know, at 15 years old, 16 years old, the same guy who might have been teaching you in elementary or coaching you in the little leagues, he may have succumbed to addiction. The same man that you used to respect standing in front of the store that was washing cars, taking care of the store, he may have succumbed to addiction. And the people you look up to and admire and respect, men and women, would be in turn asking you for drugs. And that's a very confusing thing to put on a child because it puts a child in a leadership role. And children do children's childish shit. They make fun of you, they abuse you, they, they, we, we, and then you see the community doing this to people. You see the community where they would have to pay $100 to get their windows washed in the whole business, now they're paying somebody who's addicted $20. And you start to understand the mentality, and I know black, not a lot of black people haven't thought of this, you start to have a slave master's mentality. You start to look at people as though they're beneath you. You start to use people as simply as tools and not appreciate their humanity. And I never forget my mom and my mama, pretty friends, man. Light skinned as she could be, man. Every, all the dope boys wanted her. And she came to me, she came to buy something, man. I think I was scoffed. I thought he made like $10,000 on a weekend. Oh, but I was like, I went and bought all music equipment too. I ain't buy no car. I ain't do none of the shit that I wanted to do. I said, I knew I was gonna be a musician. She came to me and it was like, I'm sitting on the car, I came out the counter of money, I'm sitting on the cut, and, and she said, um, what you got? And I said, you know what? It's good, and she said. She hit it and spit. And I, that's when you know your dope ain't good. <laughs> and she said, man, all y'all got the same shit. So now, now imagine you feel like the man, this, this grown woman who know your mama, now you start to feel smaller and smaller. She said, y'all, you think I come to you because you got the best? She said, I, I used to fuck all the y'all get your dope from. I could get dope from them. I just don't want to lay down with them. And I, by the time she finished saying that, I felt like a little boy again. She had put me back in my place. She said, you know why we shop with you? And I, I looked, she said, I'm, I'm, at this one, I'm just dumbfounded. She said, because you treat us like human beings and never stop doing that and you will always have a good customer base. Don't get like these other, and so when people say, Michael, you humble, it comes out of those humbling moments. I'm no more special in that but I know I'm special and that's intact. So if I'm humble, it don't mean I don't know I'm the shit. I just understand that humility is a role that's best traveled for a great man doing great things, going great places. When she put me in my place, all the drug dealer fantasies left. Now as a practicality, if I still needed some prom shoes, I was gonna go out and right? But I never imagined again that somehow I was gonna be a black Scarface. I, I never imagined again that this was going to be my ticket out. I understood that I'm here for the purpose of trapping and buying music equipment. We had to buy the ARSR 10, we had to buy the SP, we had to buy the MPC. I understood I got put in my place, and I'm so thankful to this day for her for that, because she didn't let a little boy get man imagination and think he was more than he was. And in that humbling and understanding that because you treat people like human beings it'll get you further, I've never unlearned that lesson. I try my best to treat the person parking my car as good as I treat the chef who comes out to say hello. You know, the album is incredibly revealed. Um, what was the role of therapy in sort of unearthing all of these well, thoughts? What, doing art is therapy. Um, but being challenged to go see a therapist and, and having a black woman non-traditional therapist has been one of the best things for me because I don't fear judgment. I can just tell the truth. Doesn't mean I'm right, but at least I can just tell the truth and I don't have to mask or disguise. So, you know, I would encourage everyone to I think the you know, United States military, uh, um, ex-military, dear friend of mine, said that they'll give like their kids six sessions. I think everyone should sit and talk. You know, our grandparents only use church for therapy. They talk to the deacons, talk to the preachers. You know, our grandfathers would use the bar. 
as therapy or the, or the liquor houses. They, you know, and, and we've gotten sophisticated and we buy all these fancy European names. And spend some of that money um, with a therapist who's going to understand where you're from and help you understand and get through um, the thought of. Charlemagne the God is, one of, is like a brother to me and was an encourager. So I kind of shook off whatever, you know, whatever fear I had. My, my wife found a very amazing woman and um, I get a chance that went ups or downs to speak to her. So therapy has been good for me because it has allowed me to be unashamed in my honesty. You know, I, I, I carried a lot of guilt. You know, when you don't know something, it's easy, you know, ignorance is bliss. But I knew at 14, you're not supposed to be selling dope. And I'd always carried this guilt. And that's why when you hear hearing rich, you know what I'm saying, I, I say they used us. You know, we were used, and, and I, didn't, I had to accept that I had an accountability, but I also had to accept that I couldn't control it all. And I was as much a victim as a bunch of other 14-year-olds was. And when I started understanding that at some point I decided to stop participating in my own victimization, that I had already forgiven myself, I just had to do it in practice every day. I didn't have to keep worrying about. I didn't have to, you know, I'd bump into people who I used to know and they like, man, I'm so proud of you. And I'm thinking to myself, I used to sell you drugs. And, but they really were genuinely proud. And I had, I had one ex addict tell me, he said, hey man, hey big boy, fat boy, yes. You know what I did was my choice. He said, I didn't get it for you, I was gonna get it for somebody else. He said, but what I did was my choice. He said, y'all was children, y'all didn't know no better. And it just lifted me, like, like to be forgiven. Oh man, to be forgiven, to carry around a hurdle, you know, to, be, to carry around this, this hindered, this weight, and to be forgiven. I, I can't not do my best. I've been forgiven, you know, I've been forgiven by the same people that I was participating in this devilish thing with. And I, I, so I, I can't help but, but represent well for them. I can't help but be the best I can be. You know, and, and that's what I'm going to continue to do to the day I D.I.E. And I appreciate the opportunity, you know, to do so. Yeah, that's real. For this record, you had no ID as your executive producer. And, yeah. But my understanding is that he brought much more to the table than just great music. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was that part of the process like, and what did he pull out of you? Um, it was like, you know, I was, when I was remember Luke Skywalker was stuck in the swamp with Yoda, you know, like, you know, I come in there with me because I called my manager Will, Will's white, and uh, it was hilarious because Dion just is in the room at first and he's not saying nothing, nobody's saying, and we like, what, what the, he's like, all these people got to be in here. It just need to be me and you were saying, cuz got everybody out the room and it's just me and him. He said, so what you trying to do? I said, what you mean? I'm trying to do I heard you. He, no, but what you trying to do? He started asking questions like my god therapist. And I'm just like, well, I don't, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a solo out, but what you trying to say? What you mean? Look, you hear the records, you hear what I'm saying? No, but what, is, what are you trying to say with this piece of art? He, he pushed me. Every time I thought I was tired, he said, we got another lap to go. Every time I thought I had cut as deep as I can go, he said, there's a deeper cut to, to go. He challenged me, and he didn't do it abrasively. He didn't do it in a, in a menacing way. He, he, he simply pushed me further than I knew I could go. The Honorable C-Note is not the executive producer, but one of the main producers. Um, C-Note just became like a Dre to Snoop to me. Like, I don't give a damn how good I thought something was. Here comes C-Note, fat boy. And C-Note, C, he fatter than me. Fat boy, you need to go back in. You need to, um, you need to do that over, fat <laughs> And I'm just like, we developed this beautiful bond, both what our grandparents had, my grandparents in our life both loved music, both were in these outskirt places. He's from Michigan, I'm from Georgia. But we bonded, so with all the producers, a genuine bond, but with, in particular with Dion pushing me, not music, but pushing me to push myself. With C-Note, who, who grew up a chubby kid just like me, popular, but understood that good enough ain't enough. Perfection will be the only thing, the pursuit of perfection, the relentless pursuit of it is all we accept. I was in there with a championship team. And then I'm in there with Cuz, and he like, if I put on the beat and you ain't rapping in the first 20, 30 years, we not with the beat. And I'm like, no, nah, but what's they said? I don't give a who sent the beat. If it doesn't move you, then we not gonna worry about it. So I cut a lot of the excess 
bullshit out. I cut the expectations of what people think. What was I thinking? What do I have to say? Because there are millions of people out there that want that to be said because it hasn't been said. Who said something for junkies? We're a generation whose parents were addicts. Our uncles were addicts. Our favorite aunties were addicts. Some of our children now are addicts. Are we going to have empathy on them or are we going to make the same mistakes we made in the 80s and let Joe Biden's crime law pass again? Let get Bill Clinton again? You know, we're going to have to really say to ourselves one day, like, did I go deeper? Did I try harder? And that's what No ID gave me. He gave me the want and will to go deeper, to try harder. He taught me to question myself, not from a place of self-doubt, but from a place of have I done enough? And by the time we turn this album in, we just, we just put it, we done enough. We couldn't do anything else. And, I, and I'm talking about, I started with one mixer, left and went through three, four more mixes before we found the right mixers. And again, my wife is seeing this account. She like, do you got another family? You know? So I, um, I appreciate Dion for giving me the discipline to learn how to make a Killer Mike album because that's something that's priceless. It'll never be forgotten. It'll never take me two years again. And it'll never take me that much of my own money. You know? You've talked about the dichotomy of sort of the, the Wolverine and Logan. And this album is called Michael by Killer Mike. Yes. And I'm curious, how do you sort of perceive the difference between Michael and Killer Mike? Uh, Killer Mike's a superhero. He's a bad ass. He ain't taking no sh he's a, he's, he's nine-year-old boys create characters. Like boys, <laughs> boys need danger and adventure. Every boy doesn't play good baseball, football, basketball. So they do things like jujitsu. They go get lost in the woods for eight hours. They get into race cars. And Killer Mike is the persona of that nine-year-old boy wanting to be a bad. He's a chubby kid. He's the slowest on the bike, but sleepy gonna wait on him while everybody else leaves. Go say, come on, fat boy. You know? He's the, he's the kid that was, that was nervous about talking to girls, and Ken Walton kissed him on the cheek and said, you cute. And he never lacked confidence again. So he built this character, Super Mike. You know what I mean? He's, I mean? Killer Mike, who's a Superman of sorts. Bad day, worst day, snapping and trapping. But under that is learning, it's lessons, it's highs, it's lows, it's love, it's loss, it's pain, it's triumph, it's tragedy. And Michael, the little boy who he really is, wanted the opportunity to speak. I love that. Well, Mike, thank you so much I mean, for giving us you. your time and your candor. And I would like to toast to you and to everyone that came and to our sponsors uh, and our partners at Trace and uh, for helping us to create this platform for those who are willing to fail twice and get up Trace. Love.